Welcome to our workforce development webinar series. We are so excited to have you here. Today, we're gonna to focus on three key metrics that are top of mind among state workforce initiatives. How do we one, attract, two, retain, and three, cultivate talent in our states to drive economic development and close skills gaps. With a current talent shortage and the growing reduction of the labor force, we want to talk about what states can do to stay competitive and mitigate risk. On top of those three metrics, we're going to focus on understanding what impact this next generation of talent is going to have on attraction, retention, and risk. My name is Jennifer Kolb, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Tallow. And joining me is Ashley Dye, Vice President of Data and Strategy at Tallow. We've got 30 minutes and I have no doubt it's gonna fly by quickly. We encourage your participation. Um, so make sure you use the Q&A box so Ashley can answer your questions live and in real time. Um, so we're gonna jump right in today. Ashley, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Jen. Happy to be here. Yeah, so we know today that we're going to be taking a look, talking about citing tallow data. But before we dive into what the data is telling us, will you just share a little bit about where our data comes from? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's really important to first look at, you know, who tallow supports from a user perspective and why this data, what we collect and why this data is important to workforce initiatives. Um, I might actually go ahead and share my screen here so you all can see some visuals at the same time. So yeah. give me a moment and I'll do that. Okay, so Talos platform has nearly 1.7 million talent users that are in high school, college, and early workforce. And of this talent, 1.3 million over 1.3 million, which is 80% are actually projected to be and enter the workforce in the next three years by 2025. So with this state, with this gen next generation entering the workforce, states understanding the future plans of this talent and how they're making decisions is really imperative to mitigate that risk and stay competitive in the market. What's unique about what we capture in Talos platform and Talos data is that we actually learn about our talents users plans and interests so just that right including where they want to live geographically their next steps their career interests their employer interests and and much more um we've found some really interesting trends year over year on talents location preferences and their behavior um, that really does show what's driving attraction retention and risk for states nationwide that we're excited to talk about today well, let's start there. So that's super interesting, location preference. Um, so for early talent, you know, we we often wonder, are they even thinking about where they want to live in their future, right? They um, And how do they know what's available to them outside of their, you know, where they're at currently? So how does that location preference translate into attraction, retention, and risk? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it's it's important to also talk a little bit about maybe further in detail how we capture this data too. So as you mentioned, do we know if talent's even thinking about those things, right? So in Tallow, um, when a user comes on the platform, they go through a series of questions about their interests. So that of course includes those location preferences and much more so that we can best match them with employer industry and education connections for all types of opportunity, whether it's a learning opportunity, apprenticeship, an actual job, admissions for colleges. Um, so when we actually ask these questions, they're prompted with these series of questions and for location preference, they're able to select um, one or more multiple states that they have an interest in. So where they want to live for work, for, for next steps. Some talent may select several states or they may only select one. So given this, we normalize our data to create what we call a geographic preference score for this talent. Because when you're in high school, you may have more than one state that you're interested in, right? Um, but we call this geographic preference score Talos, uh, talent GPS score, like GPS tracking. Um, so we can actually take this GPS score with the other interests that we capture of talent, like career interests, next steps, to give some really interesting insight into a state's attraction, retention, and risk. 
Okay, this is this is really interesting. I'm such a visual learner too. So um, do you have some examples that you can walk us through? Yes, I definitely do. Uh, we can move on to show some of these examples. So I think I think what's important to think about, right? So of course, attraction, retention, and risk. And as I mentioned, talent can select multiple different states. They could select just the state that they live in. So I think what's important to start with this data is to first look at overall migration interests of talent talent. And we think about early talent migrating, they could sit in a few buckets based on our methodology. So definite migration, which this means is that only selected, they, this talent is only selected states outside of their current location. Possible migration means that they could have selected their current state plus other states um, outside of their current location or open to any location or uh, retention. So that means that they're only selecting the state that they live in currently. And of our tallow population, 64% of tallow talent have an interest in migrating to a location different from their current state. So that includes definite migration and possible migration. And 36% are planning to stay put. Um, when we combine this with career interest data, we can actually look at interests of the early talent that fit into these buckets as well. So um, you can see over here, this is looking at both um, 2020 and 2021, 2020 and 2021 for definite and possible migration and retention, um, and then migration by career interest. Uh, so for definite migration, some of the top career interests of, of talent that's planning to go elsewhere from the, their current location is technology, communications, transportation, uh, distribution, and logistics. Possible migration is STEM and agriculture. And then the top for retention, which I found was really, really interesting, was um, education and healthcare. So this data can give you some really interesting insights when you know what careers early talent is interested in that are located in your state and talent interested in coming to your state to make informed decisions on how you should react to cultivate that talent and attract new talent for closing skills gaps and attracting industries. Yeah, that is fascinating, especially when it comes to state development. You know, if you're able to predict what jobs are going to be in demand three, four, five years in advance to look at the talent in the classroom today and see based on those those data points of do they want to stay? Uh, are they on the right pathway, whether it's a college or a career pathway, right? Are they on the right track to get into the jobs that your state's going to need? That is Super, super fascinating and interesting. Um, so if, if we go back a second, Ashley, to the GPS score, do you have any uh, stats on specific states where you've seen some, some differences in that early talent migration? Yeah, we definitely do. Um, we've, we've actually done some comparison year over year um, as well with this uh, geographic preference score. And we've compared 21, uh, 2021 into 2020, but I'll start with uh, 2021. So some of the top states that are poised to win among attraction, retention, and risk for just 2021 of early talent may not really surprise you, right? So when we look at attraction, retention, and risk, we're taking into consideration the multiple states that they may have chosen, again, creating this score and normalizing that data based on our methodology. But again, the top states are Texas, New York, Florida, and California, right? Again, not super surprising big hubs, but year over year, when we look at that data for those particular states, they're actually uh, declining in what we call our geographic preference score. So Texas um, is ranked number one for attraction year over year, but they're ranked at the very bottom for talent retention. New York has a really small uptick for early talent and attraction, but also uh, losing talent just a little bit less than Texas is. And Florida is almost as high as Texas in attraction, but losing talent just as fast as Texas. And the last one for California, they have actually significantly decreased year over year in attraction, ranked at the very bottom uh, for talent attraction and significantly increased talent uh, planning to leave, uh, which is what's impacting their year over year score. So 
when we look at the states that are showing an upward trajectory year over year, it actually probably will surprise you. Um, and some of these states include Arizona, Nebraska, West Virginia, and Utah. Um, and I really dug into this data, trying to figure out, you know, which ones we want to talk about, which ones are really kind of showing some stories here. And I, I was curious with these states and they're increasing year over year, their geographic preference for of our talent. Where is that talent coming from and what's causing that uptick? So sure enough, some of the top states that are declining year over year are losing some of their talent to these particular states. So that ranking is going from California's losing talent to some of these states, Texas, then Florida, then New York. Um, with looking at these particular states, I'm also seeing within Arizona and Utah, they have a stronger influence in their year over year geographic preference score based on attraction. So a lot of this talent is um, more saturated of attraction to Arizona and Utah. And Nebraska and West Virginia are still attracting talent, but their geographic preference score year over year is, is higher um, because primarily because of retention. So really interesting data to look at when you compare this year over year to understand what are these states that are up and coming and the opportunities that states have as well as how other states can mitigate their risk against um, you know losing the talent uh, to other states that they may have for particular skills gaps or careers that they're um, trying to to close. That's helpful. Um, any Yellowstone fans out there? Are we seeing migration patterns based on a hit a hit show right now. <laughs> Super hey, Montana is up there too. <laughs> <It definitely laughs> is. Um, uh, Ashley, just for clarity, we had this question come in. I believe um, it's kind of hard to see that scale um, in the bottom right. The darker states are more populated. Is that what the scale is between the colors and the maps? Correct. Yep. Yeah. So what you're looking at here for geographic preference score, where their higher geographic preference score um, is the darker, right? So you can see the change that happens over into the year over year data. So we have Texas and California, uh, you know, New York, Florida, that's why they're darker. And then you see the darker states like Arizona, even Alaska and Hawaii, a lot of our talent um, there's a ton of talent that choose Hawaii and Alaska as an interest. And a lot of things we're doing is, is tracking some of this year over year to find out, um, you know, the talent that they actually capture as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and just any other questions you guys might have, feel free to put those in the Q&A box. Um, so Ashley, is there a way to understand when talent is actually migrating to these different locations? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, within our platform, um, I think it's important to understand that talents coming on potentially middle school, talents coming on in high school, talents coming on in college, we're able to track this talent, you know, across the course of of their lifespan on Talo. Um, but what's really important when we think about this data is looking at them in different perspectives as well. So since we have both high school and college talent on our platform, it's important to not only understand, you know, when they're migrating, but is there a boomerang effect and will, uh, and when will this talent potentially be in the workforce? So when I think about high school talent, I have some kind of interesting stats I can pull up here. 72% um, of high school talent that are college bound um, are likely not planning to stay or return to their current state or location to live and work. So this means that whether they end up in their current state for their next step of college or um, they intend to go somewhere else uh, for college, the majority of this talent isn't, it, it intends to migrate somewhere else when they enter the workforce, which is really interesting. And then once the talent is in college, they plan to stay in their location because there's a potential of 84% of college talent currently plan to stay where they're located as they enter the workforce. Um, this stat up here is explaining that 63% of talent intend to stay in their current location and an additional 20% might stay. So that potential gets us, us up to 84%. So, 
when we look at some of the the workforce projection of this um, this of Talos high school and college talent, the majority of high school talent have five to six years before entering the workforce, and college talent have around three years. But on our platform, but given some recent data, we've also learned that this uh, trajectory, this projection, and when talent is going to enter the workforce, it might be sooner than we initially thought. So early talent is actually starting to consider entering the workforce before they finish their degree or directly from high school. So I have some additional stats that I wanna share because I think these are really interesting. But 47% of college students have considered transitioning to the workforce before completing their degree. And 33% of high school students have considered going directly into the workforce versus completing a two or four year degree. When we asked, why um, this talent is indicating it's because of 73% uh, said cost of tuition and 67% um, are recognizing potentially the ability to enter the workforce and obtain their degree at the same time or finish their degree at the same time. So I find this data extremely interesting. Um, this is a newer trend for us as we're capturing this information to try to you know, understand what's shifting in the market. And uh, will be interesting as we continue to track this and how it affects future migration for early talent and getting, as you know, getting the right connections early on will be imperative for both talent and employers to actually stay competitive with this talent as they're thinking about things earlier on. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think we talk a lot about that with our partners. Um, so Ashley, share a little bit with us. How does early talent want to connect with colleges and with employers? Yeah, absolutely. So early talent, um, when we think about them, it's really early and often, right? Um, talent is making decisions much earlier in the newer generation on their futures and their future employers. Um, their researchers. So 70% of early talent are deciding on their future employers in high school or early college. Uh, early college means freshman and sophomore year of college. And 46% um, of that 70% are actually saying that they, they're making these choices when they're in high school. 78% um, of talent believe it's really important to start learning and connecting with employers in high school. They want to learn. They're, they're ready to start understanding this. Otherwise, they're also going out and seeking this information. Um, and like I said, this talent is, you know, they're researchers. They're craving more information, more connection. They have, they have information at their fingertips and they want that connection to understand more. What's also really interesting about this talent um, that we've tracked year over year is that brand awareness is becoming a bigger factor in the decision-making process because as of 2021 compared to 2022, talent is 21% less willing to actually consider a future employer if they weren't familiar with their brand. So that means that talent and getting in front of them early not only to connect, but also, you know, help them understand who you are. Their perception is something completely different, which we see a lot of with early talent. It's really important um, as you're trying to, you know, cultivate talent in your state and close skills gaps later on. But as I mentioned, talent is looking for experience, information, and connection. And the top three things that would change their mind about a future employer include hands-on experience, so work study, internship, apprenticeship, more information on benefits, financial potential, what that career trajectory would look like, and connection, you know, with the current employees or interns, they're looking to get their questions answers. They want that Q&A opportunity um, or webinar. Those are some actionable things that employers can do within a state to be able to, um, you know, again, can, uh, again, uh, facilitate the process of employers building their talent pipeline and getting in front of this talent as they're making those, those decisions early on. Um, and one of the other things, it's a stat on this slide too, it's to mention it again, connecting with the talent early on is really imperative because the difference with the new generation is that they also are planning to stay with their first employer much longer than the previous generation. 
We've actually done this question multiple times over the last three years to understand this difference. And year over year, we have seen a steady increase in talent that are planning to stay at their employer four plus years, um, which is always the highest bucket that they're choosing. And 51% of early talent plan to stay at least three years um, with their first employer. That was both in 2020 and 2021. Interesting. So um, in that same light, we had a question come in and not just about when, but how. So um, the question says, does Tallow have any data from their user population on where they want to be reached out on? So we currently are using LinkedIn heavily, but we've been looking more closely to social media outlets. Yeah, that's a that question. <laughs> No, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I think that there we we've actually asked this question to our talent, of course, as well. And you know, talent is talent is is not looking for um, looking for employers on the social media the social media outlets, right? So we know that the majority of talent are. Um, hoping to connect with employers uh, through email and pro professional social sites like LinkedIn or Tallow. Um, they're, they're not even researching companies on social media. They're going to company websites. They're going to Google. So TikTok and Instagram and Facebook come in dead last, you know, for where they want to actually connect and where they're truly researching information um, around their future employer and, and that career trajectory. Okay, that's really good to know. The email piece is interesting to me. So um, that's, that's interesting that it was the top there. Um, another question that's come in, Ashley, um, as far as how we're getting this data that we're sharing today, um, how often are we polling or surveying or reaching out to our students to report this back? Yeah, that's a great question. So we are um, connecting different insight data like this as far as some of these questions around when they're making decisions and their behavior. Um, uh, several times a month. And the data that we are capturing for the platform around their profiles can be updated on a, a, a daily basis. Uh, so talent is logging in and updating their career interests or their geographic preference. So a lot of this data is moving. Um, it's real time. When we talk about you know migration and what's happening with this early talent, what's happening in your state, and then perception data is, again, data that we capture um, on a frequent basis as well and do um, different questions every two weeks um, of our talent. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that has come in is, um, do you all release this data? So I know what my answer to that is. <laughs> I'm happy to put my email in the chat, uh, but um, you can definitely go to tally.com, explore our blog section. We post a lot of this data on our LinkedIn. Um, but Ashley, anything else you would want to add to that as far as how we're releasing and sharing this information? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, like, like you said, Jen, there's a ton of data um, that we release as far as some of the perception generalization around our talent um, on uh, our blogs. But if you're thinking about, you know, do I want to see this data for my particular state? Um, that's something that we welcome the opportunity to, to share and where your state sits with your early geographic preference score um, and then strategize on ways to help you achieve your goals. Again, that would be reaching out to Tallow to work with us. We want to understand, you know, what it is your goals that we'd be uh, producing, you know, some um, some data packages for you. Uh, but we have, like you've seen through our our slides today, the, a strong talent pool nationwide with representation among all 50 states. 
um, and have built out this geographic preference score um, for uh, all 50 states as well. So I think there's different, different elements of the data that we do have. So some that's out there, some that's not, some that folks have to pay for, um, but we're happy to work with anybody that has an interest to see what data we can provide that can help them achieve their goals. Yeah, thank you. Another question that's come in, um, and it's kind of similar, how are you communicating the data with employers? So same kind of things, you can go to our blog, you can go to our LinkedIn. Also just in partnership with a lot of the employers we work with, the data is a part of the strategy. So whether we're helping you build a pipeline for an internship, an apprenticeship, an open job, um, or just general brand awareness, right? Ashley threw out the stat about how critical it is to have that brand presence in order to recruit and build your talent pipeline. So um, the data is just a constant piece of the strategy we're putting in place, um, but also sharing it externally through our channels. Um, Ashley, is there anything you'd add to that? Again, just how we're communicating that data with employers specifically? Uh, I think what's really uh, just one thing to add there, uh, it's a great point that the, the data that we have is in conjunction with the strategy, right? And I think to give you some examples, when employers are working with us with our data, it's to understand, you know, what are the gaps that exist for my brand and how can I implement a strategy to, to, to close those perception gaps. So we work with a lot of employers from perception. We work with a lot of employers, employers around um, attraction, retention, risk, what's happening in their employable locations um, with this early talent. And what is the content that is gonna be successful uh, that's gonna get you the ability to build that pipeline um, and additionally close those gaps. So again, I think that maybe just gives a little context on how employers leverage the data at a high level too. Yeah, and in that same vein, another question that's come in, um, and I don't, I don't think we're going to share the name of any employers today on this call specifically. But um, the question is, do you have an example of an employer you've worked with um, in creating a customized data for? Um, we do, we definitely do. We have examples of employers that we've, we've done some really heavy data, uh, analytic for, um, in a lot of different ways, uh, from what their perception gaps are to recommendations around how they're achieving the appropriate outcomes, what the trajectory looks like for their pipeline, um, impact. I mean, you name it, um, there's some very large employers that we work with that um, love Tallow's data. And so it's continually evolving, but as Jen said, um, really it, it's a part of the strategy to support and make our clients successful to achieve their goals. Yeah, it's Tallow really does take that recruitment strategy of what you might see in the athletic world. You know, I'm a Clemson University alum, so no bias here, but you know, Dabo Sweeney, he doesn't go and start recruiting his star quarterback you know, a couple of weeks before that kid graduates high school. He starts reaching out as add to seventh graders and eighth graders and ninth graders to build that culture, build that sense of community and say, hey, we're Clemson and we want you, right? And so you see that in the world of marketing, right? There's a reason we see Pepsi and Geico and all of these brands every day because they're saying, hey, we're here and we want your business, buy from us. So it's the same kind of thing as a HR, recruiting, talent acquisition, enrollment for a college, you have to take into account that we are all inundated with our information, right? We, we live here every day, brands are just thrown at us. And so in order to kind of cut through all of that noise, you have to start reaching out early. Um, a student has to see you as someone who said, hey, we're so-and-so and we're here to hire you. We have an internship that'll make an impact in your future. We have a career path or a program that'll make an impact as far as getting you a, a well, high paying job. Um, so it, when it comes to the data and working with employers, that's our strategy. What's your end goal? You know, what, what do you need to hire for? How many people do you need to hire? What's your timeline? And then going back into the classroom and saying, okay, how can students learn more about your opportunities, get seen and think of you as the employer they wanna work for? Um, so 
we're right at time. Ashley, I don't know if there's anything else that we've missed or you want to share before we sign off for the day. Well, I think, you know, I, we've got both probably workforce and employers on the line today. Um, there are some resources that we do have from uh, a really large survey uh, around industry ranking for interest and employer ranking for interest among different industries. I would just encourage if that's something that you're interested in too, that um, that we can we can share some of that with you. We didn't talk in detail around what those look like among the perception of the early talent. So know that there's resources out there that can give you some immediate insight. And again, we're here to help um, with the, the data that we do have uh, to, to make you all successful. So thank you all for your time. Yeah, thanks so much, Ashley, for joining us. I think this has been really incredible to see. I love the, the GPS score. So um, Alexa is going to put up a slide. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, my contact information, Ashley's contact information is there. Let them know however we can. Um, and make sure to join us next week on January 18th, James Richter, who's the Director of Workforce Development and Member Relations at the South Carolina Manufacturing Alliance, is going to be walking through a real life case study. Um, so we have partnered with the state of South Carolina for a couple years now. Um, and as we have worked together, um, we have put together a case study so you can see what that relationships look like, how they use this incredible data um, to build brand awareness, get kids in jobs in the state, and also um, most recently connect with the military community. So we're so excited. Um, thanks everyone for your time. Ashley, thanks for joining us. And we hope to see you on the 18th.